All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Deanna Singh, who is in Wisconsin. How are you doing, Deanna? Wonderful. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing great. And Deanna is described as a trailblazer and dynamic speaker who is at the forefront of social change. She's an award-winning author, educator, business leader, and social justice champion, and the founder and chief agent, uh, chief change agent of Flying Elephant, an umbrella organization for four social ventures, all of which are dedicated to shifting power uh, to marginalized communities. And what we're going to talk about today, as a prolific author, we're going to talk to you about your latest book, um, which is called Action Speak Louder, a step-by-step -step guide to becoming an inclusive workplace. So, uh, Diana, let, let's um, jump straight into it. I mean, this is your, how many books have you written now? Fifth or sixth, is it? Yeah, I think sixth book. Sixth <laughs> book, okay. All right, and, just, uh, and uh, uh, give, give me the genesis of this book in particular. Um, what prompted you to write this as your sixth? Absolutely. So in my work, John, I get the opportunity to spend a lot of time working with amazing organizations all over the world. And in that work, one of the, the big themes that I see is that there's nobody I've met to date, right? I've yet to meet somebody who says, oh, you know what I want to do? I want to create an exclusive working environment. I want to create a place <laughs> where people don't feel like they can thrive, where they're sad when they come to work, when they can't wait to go back home, right? Like those are not the kinds of characteristics that people describe to me about what they want when they come into an organization. No, what they want is the exact opposite. So it's not that there's a lack of desire, but what I have found is that there's actually a, a lack of understanding of how to get there, right? What does it actually look like for me to create those kinds of environments and that kind of culture where people love coming to work and, and our goodwill spreads and more people want to join our organization. And so because I saw that as a gap, that's really what motivated it from a professional side is how do I make sure that I could provide more, you know, well-researched information that's accessible, that's actually things that people could do that's tangible um, into the world so that people could reach that goal of, of being a more inclusive community and a more inclusive organization. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Because I mean, to your point, I mean, I think a lot of people, if you if you interviewed them or whatever, you know, hiring people, people who run companies, you know, they would all they would say, well, you know, we try to attract the best people, um, regardless. That's what we we try to do. But obviously, um, how you attract people is different according to maybe the culture or the life experience of the people you're trying to attract come from. And, and I guess that's part of maybe the learning curve for us all. Absolutely. You know, there's so many people who are in the world right now competing. It is a highly competitive mm -hmm. market on yeah. who is going to be able to get the best talent. And some of the key distinguishing characteristics, right? Like a lot of times people think, oh, it's, you know, where we are in the world or, and we know because of remote work, that doesn't really matter mm -hmm. as much anymore. Yeah. Um, it's about how much we pay. Well, absolutely. You want to make sure that you have fair wages and that you're competitive in the marketplace, but that those are really not the key driving forces. A lot of the key driving forces is what is the reputation of this organization within the larger community, right? Do people have trust within the community? Am I going to go there and feel like I can actually bring my best work and bring my best ideas? Am I going to grow there? You know, those are the questions that people are asking. And in a competitive landscape, if you're not taking that into consideration, where, where people are coming from and what experiences they're bringing with them to work, uh, then you're really being left out, right? Because they're, mm -hmm. because the companies that are thriving are doing that every single day. Yeah, and I think a lot of other people are kind of scratching their heads a little because they're getting so many different um, pieces of advice or they're reading and they're not sure what exactly they should be doing. And it all seems very confusing um, because, you know, when people have like, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, initiatives um, going on in, in companies, I still think they're kind of confused as to not, the, not what the purpose is. I think people understand what the purpose is, but but basically on the, the execution side, yes. it's still very, very confusing. Absolutely. And that's where we were seeing, right, the confusion is here are the big questions. Okay. I get it. I understand it. I understand why it's important. Um, but one is, one big question is, 
but how do I help other people understand it? So in the book, we definitely mm -hmm. help people with this is what it looks like to build your case. These are some things that you can use. This is really a process and a structure that you can use as you're thinking about it. And also just, you know, being able to guard, guard yourself in that too, right? Because the work can get hard. So how do I make sure that this isn't just a passing fad, but something that I can mm -hmm. really commit to? So we definitely answered that question. And then the second, you know, kind of big question is to your point, well, what does it mean? Like, what do I do? Like, what changes in my day-to-day -day practices? What am I doing differently? Um, and so in the book, it's meant to be like, you literally can read a chapter, get up, and then enact the things that are, are in the book. Somebody asked me, uh, John, I didn't know how to take this, but I, I decided to take it as a, as a compliment. But they asked, they're like, is this kind of like a recipe book, you know, like a, a step by step? And I'm like, yeah, it, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't know if you're making like a DEI cake here, but it, but it is something meant to be like a guide, right? Something that you can pick up and, and put into practice. Yeah, well, I, I would take that as a compliment. I decided, I yeah. Think, <laughs> yeah I, I think there's so many, there's so much theoretical stuff out there that I think, you know, people need a lot of practical step by steps. Um, well, here, here's an interesting one, uh, just a question. So if you say you're, you know, you, you run a company or a company and you, you believe um, certainly that you hire the best candidates, regardless of background, regardless of culture, maybe you, you hire the best candidates, but you don't get that much mixture of candidates applying to your company. So is that an is that an example of where maybe things are a little out of sync? I mean, you believe that you are doing the best job you can hiring, but you're not attracting people from, uh, you're not attracting a very diverse candidate pool. So this is a question that we get quite often. And actually we hit it head on in the book when we talk about how people often pose that challenge, right? So I, I will tell you the way that I hear it most commonly. Mm -hmm. Well, in this sector, in this industry, in this part of the country or this part of the world, we don't really have that many diverse candidates. They're just not applying to our positions. And so mm -hmm. one of the questions that I ask all of the time um, in response to that is, well, what are you doing? What are you doing actually that if you were thinking about it as a reverse pitch almost, right? What are you doing that would make a diverse candidate want to apply for your position? What does your brand say about who you are as an organization? Do you look like a welcoming organization? Where are you going to post your job descriptions? Are you going into communities that look like the same communities that you already have within your organization? Or are you diversifying where you're putting out your job descriptions? How, how are you writing those descriptions? Are you writing it in a way that it's antiquated that might not actually reflect? You know, we, we like to use these terms like we are looking for the very best. And then oftentimes we'll say, okay, well, great. Let's push into that criteria. You're looking for the very best at what? Help me understand what this position mm -hmm. is going to be. Then let me look at the job description and they don't match right? They don't match. The, 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 what you're actually looking for isn't reflected there. And so it kind of, uh, we sometimes can get into these status quo biases. We were just like so comfortable doing what we've always done. And and because we're so comfortable doing what we've always done, we don't ask ourselves some of the very basic questions that would allow for us to really check that that assumption, one, that people just aren't applying, right? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. right? Reversing it. Or two, that there aren't qualified candidates when really our definition of qualified doesn't really reflect what the job reflect, what the job should be reflected. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point uh, that you raised there because, um, you know, even in my own experience, I, I remember I was running a company for a while for for a parent parent company and looking at a resume one time, so fantastic. I was like, Ooh, this person's fantastic. I, went, I called up HR and I said, hey, listen, get this person for an interview. And they said, oh, no, we rejected that one. And I said, huh? I said, didn't have a college degree. And I was saying, what? They've been, they have like, they've been working for the last 20 years. Phenomenal, like great experience, but they don't have a college degree. Are you kidding me? I don't care what they did in college. I don't care that yeah. they didn't go to college. But this is, but I think this has become such a, um, there are things like that, as you mentioned, antiquated. I think that's completely antiquated, but it's a, such a thing in America now, particularly, that they won't hire without the the college degree. So you have all these people getting degrees and getting into debt and, you know, never getting the job that pays it off in the, in the first place. So I, I totally agree. We have to revisit some of our, our some of our thinking. Oh, absolutely. I'll give you another one that I see all of the time. Mm -hmm. And this is one that really goes around ability, right? But we will see... Um, it's accountant job. And it will say, must be able to lift 40 pounds. Why? Why, John? 
I mean, I know tax season, it can get really serious, yeah. right? Like the, the <laughs> yeah, amount of yeah. paperwork that you have to get, but I just no. can't imagine a situation in which an accountant that that has to be a right. And so people who come from different ability backgrounds might be like, yeah, no, this is not for me. They're not thinking about me. They have already excluded me just by not being cognizant of what they put into their job description. And so again, yeah. right, we, we get into these moments where we start to realize that there are things that we're adding that really aren't getting us the best. They're getting us more of the same. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a really good point. Well, you know, QuickBooks could be, I'm not sure that program, how heavy it is, but uh, <laughs> probably virtual. Don't know, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and, you know, and here's, here's the, here's another one, I think, and I've discussed this actually with a lot, um, with some, um, some women who are experts on, on, on trying to help women, you know, um, succeed in the workplace and get more jobs and all of that. And one of the things, and I'm sure there's, there's probably a corollary corollary here with um diversity too is that generally speaking like if a, if if a man looks at 10 requirements on a on a job description and sees two he'll go that he kind of fits he'll go, all right i'll apply whereas you know women will will not you know if they if they don't match six or more they'll be going well there's no point and i'm sure there's some there, there's some relation there also you know culturally as well so again, it's it's how do you attract people without scaring off people and just getting the people who always go, ah, yeah, that's fine. No problem. I'll give it a go. Absolutely. I mean, you have to think about it like this. It is a competitive marketplace, right? And so mm -hmm. people can be discerning about what they're looking for. So it's about what are, you know, in the, in the book, I actually go through a whole section that talks about what are the words that you're using? And I give some examples of words that, you know, we, we, we put on our on our documents that we just kind of put out there that are part of the normal vernacular that can be like uh, really loud whistles to people who are not part of a majority you know population in in that industry or in that sector or in that company that say oh we are definitely saying not you right and mm -hmm. and, and they can be words like uh, you know um, aggressive well. Right. Depending on where you come from and, and what you value culturally, like seeing the word aggressive might be like, well, nope, that's not where I'm trying to be. Right. And do you mm -hmm. really need that word? Is that really what you're trying to describe here? So, again, a, a lot of, you know, different examples of, of, of things that we might do that are sending a, so what might be silent to us, but very, very, very loud signals to people that we're trying to bring in from diverse populations. So I think that's one really huge thing. Um, but you know, there's also things too, that are just as simple as like what, when somebody goes to your website, when somebody goes to your social media platforms, what are they seeing? Well, what are the pictures that mm -hmm. you're depicting? What, what does good yeah. look like is, and the way that you're portraying it? How do you even talk about where you're at in your diversity, equity, and inclusion work? Are you authentic about it? There are so many people who are not even applying to your positions because they're going and they're spending five minutes on your social media platforms or on your website and deciding, right, based off of what they see there, how much they think they can trust you. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. When the stock images that you put on your website actually just are very un unrepresentative and even unrepresentative of who you are as a company, too. I right. I love that part. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, do you know, the other thing that I was I, I was I see you have in your book here is around mentoring. And I think that's a, I think mentoring is such an important thing, because, as I said, at the outset, it doesn't matter how long you've been in business, like whether you're whether you're an old grizzled veteran like myself or um, or somebody new coming in. The, 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 the workplace is just changing so, so dramatically and things that, like like you just mentioned with wording like. It's not something that would spring to your mind immediately. So you need people to help you, to coach you, to point you in the right direction rather than send like, here's your 50 page DIE memo to read. Um, you, you, you actually need people to guide you and help you through this. Oh, absolutely. So one of the things I have the great pleasure of doing is talking to a lot of CEOs, right, in, in the work that I do. And these are CEOs of Fortune 100 companies or CEOs of, you know, NGOs or CEOs of smaller mm -hmm. nonprofits, just you, runs really the, the, the gamut of different um, organizations, but all of them in this executive role. And right away, like I learn a lot 
right? Based on how they talk about how they got to where they are. Because the people who can say without any hesitation, it's part of how they like talk about their story. You know what? I was mentored in this way, or I really needed this support, or this is how I got like those people who are attuned to it. I know right away I can have a very different conversation with them about what inclusion is going to look like in their organization because they have already experienced what it feels like, right? They they know the personal benefit of it. And what I always think is interesting is that sometimes I have to pry a little bit more with some of, you know, those executives. But inevitably, we always get to this moment where people are like, oh, yeah, no, I wouldn't have gotten here without the help of others, right? Like if, if somebody hadn't pointed me in the right direction or helped me, um, you know, step over something that I really, I was about to step in and it would have been a problem, right? <laughs> if I couldn't, if I didn't have that guidance. And so, what we talk about in the book is that a lot of times with mentorship, it's this assumption, right, that everybody knows they're supposed to get the mentors. And there's also an assumption that everybody is getting the mentorship. And that's just not the case. A mm -hmm. lot of times when you're coming from an underrepresented population, you've been taught by, you know, from cultural references or that everything is meritocracy, right? That if I'm supposed to get something, it's going to be because I worked really hard, not because I had somebody who has helped guiding me, like that's cheating in some ways. And so understanding that that's a perception that really exists. And on the other mm -hmm. end, also understanding that, you know, in a lot of mentor relationships, so whether it's formal or informal, what we tend to do is look and seek people who look like us right? Who have similar backgrounds, who we can see ourselves in. And so what ends up happening is that we constantly are sort of perpetuating this exchange of knowledge, right? Mm. To certain groups. And then other groups are being left behind because one, they don't understand or maybe haven't had the experience of mentorship in the way that it can really benefit and, and that it should be normalized for them. And then two, mm -hmm. you have the double whammy of like, and people are not necessarily looking at them as candidates for mentorship. And so we talk a lot about how that's really important. I, I think the other thing you mentioned too, is it doesn't matter what space you're in. If you're doing this kind of work, you're going to need some people who can give you, right, some, some, some feedback on how things are going. You're in I'm a DEI expert. I make mistakes every day. So you have to like also understand you're going to make mistakes, but you have to have people who are willing to share with you. Here's some other ways that you could think about doing it or, or give you the kind of grace that you need in order to continue to learn. So uh, mentorship is just such a critical component of making any of this work. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I could, I could imagine that, uh, I mean, it's obviously better that you, um, that you initiate some kind of uh, DEI initiative. However, um, if you do, a, if you do, if you do it badly or misguidedly or however, you know, even with the best of intentions, I'm sure just like anything else, it could have, um, even more detrimental impact. Oh yeah. And I think that that's one of the reasons why, you know, when you think about the impact of this work and I'm so excited to be able to hear from people. I actually, just before I got in this interview, got a, a text message from someone who said, I just finished it and I'm using this to completely rewrite our plan, right. Of, of what we're going to do. And that's the, those are the moments as an author, mm -hmm. uh, those are the moments I live for, right. Hearing how people are enacting this, all, all the things that we talk about. But I think it's really important to understand that it is problematic. And I, some of the biggest issues that we get are when people are walking into something, again, best intentions, no maliciousness, but they're walking into something without any guidance and really something that's kind mm -hmm. of outside of their area of expertise. Um, and they haven't brought in any of that knowledge or information. You know, you wouldn't go out and, for example, start a podcast without reading about what a podcast is and without understanding what the market looks like, without understanding how you broadcast or what materials or equipment that you would need. But somehow in the DEI space, because we don't level it up to this idea of strategy, we kind of don't think about it as a skill, we skip that step. And that becomes a problem because that then puts us in a position where we we can't really bring in those best practices and that best knowledge. Um, and, and then we end up, you know, the, in the same way that we would end up in a conundrum if we decided we we're going to start a podcast with no knowledge and no expertise and no support <laughs> or guidance. We end up in the right or, or any other area of our business. We end up in, in those same challenges when we do that with DEI. Yeah, and and I think also, I mean, I think as you said, best intentions. But sometimes people think, oh, this is I, I should have one of these initiatives because I mean, it sounds like a very good thing to do. But that's as far as you go in the investigation. Just call up, you know, HR or somebody and say, oh, listen, start it, start an initiative around this. Will you just make sure we're keeping up with everybody else? Yeah. 
No, and that's not what you want to do, right? And so again, that's why I I do really recommend having a tool and having some resources and having some people in your corner who can help you think through the process. Because like any other aspect of your business, it really has to be tied to strategy in order for it to be effective. Absolutely. And just one last thing I wanted to touch on your sure. book here, because um, it's a it's a personal um it's a personal pet peeve of mine, but you do you have a chapter on performance reviews. Yes. Talk to me a little about that because I, I absolutely think and certainly the businesses I've grown up in and I did a lot of work in, you know, I was having doing these yearly business reviews and I just never saw the point in them. And generally speaking, I mean, I thought, you know, you would kind of review people on a daily basis, but the problem was that a lot of, a lot of the ways um, performance reviews are set up, it's they're set up as like, Deanna, here's, here's something you did really well this year. Great. Well done on that. Now here's 52 things that you need to improve. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm so glad you bring this up. You know, in every chapter of the book, I start with a story. And the story really on the performance reviews is somebody who has the same kind of perspective that you just shared, right? I, I don't really know what the point of these are because all it does is perpetuate what already exists. I'm not really growing or learning or mm -hmm. moving forward in the organization. It almost feels like it's a burden, not, not an accelerator. And so one of the things that I think I think that performance reviews, if done well, can be very powerful, right? We all know what it feels like, whether it's formal or informal, that moment where somebody's like, hey, that's good. Do more of that. Or that didn't really work mm -hmm. out. Here's some other ways that, right? We remember those moments as moments and opportunities for growing. And that's what performance reviews are intended to do, not to like set us up for failure or to make us, you know, like have just all this intense anxiety. Um, and so in the book, we talk a lot about where some of those pitfalls are with performance reviews and how how they can be implemented in a way that is much more inclusive. It's about, you know, checking in more frequently. It's about letting people set their own goals. It's about making sure that you are checking your biases about what is good performance and what is not um, at the door, right? It's about all these different things that can happen that can really set you up for a lot of success when it comes to performance reviews. But again, if not done, right, it could be done with the best of intentions. But if not done with some of this perspective in mind, um, you can lead to some really negative consequences. And, and I think one of the big things here, I, I hope you're hearing this theme, but it, just in case, <laughs> want to make sure it's really clear. Um, it's all about intentions, right? It, it, it's all about how do I take my intentions and turn those into actual actions? And that's what the book is really gear, geared at doing. So your intention is to create an inclusive environment. One of the tools that you have to use or that you are using is performance reviews. How do I make sure that my intention of creating an inclusive environment shows up in my performance reviews, shows up in my recruiting, shows up in my mentorship, shows up in all these different aspects of the business that really cumulatively decide what my culture is going to feel like within an organization? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree because I think uh, I think that the, the challenges are there if you look at um, – I mean, somebody told me recently that we have four, if not five generations in the workplace. I don't know what the fifth is, but anyway, they they're an expert, so I'll trust them. <laughs> so we've got multi gen, we got multi generational uh, workplaces. We've got um, obviously multicultural um, workplaces. As you mentioned earlier, with remote working and with contract working or whatever, you get people from across the globe working with you so the idea of one size fits all like it was you know kind of having you know well this is the way we've all was done uh reviews or you know this it's it's just nothing is going to work for everybody anymore so to your point is you have to be intentional plus you have to drill down a bit and go you know maybe i have to approach this this you know section a little bit differently than this section because otherwise they won't hear me Oh, absolutely i mean at the end of the day the question is are you trying to be right or are you trying to be effective Mm -hmm. Right. And and the answers to both of those things are not always the same. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. Right. And so I, I do think that that's important, that moment of discernment and reflecting and stopping and saying, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What are we doing ourselves that's actually getting in the way of our ability to achieve? Yeah, no, I love that. I love the fact and, and take it back on ourselves. Like, what are, what are we doing to inhibit all of this? You know, so it's always that idea of like, let's take, you know, it's like, per, I love the one with the, if you say to people, uh, personal accountability, uh, everyone go, yes, 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 I'm, I'm totally in favor of it, but they mean it for other people rather than themselves. <laughs> <you know? laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, well, listen, thanks. Thanks so much, Deanna. So the book is called Actions Speak Louder, a step by step guide to becoming an inclusive work uh, workplace available on all good booksellers. It'll be below this video as well. Uh, and all of Deanna's information. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and the work you do. Absolutely. So we have, as you mentioned, four different social enterprises, all with the focus of shifting power to marginalized communities. But the company that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion is called Uplifting Impact. And we'd welcome you to check our website out. It's www.upliftingimpact.com. And you can find out more information about our annual summit. We do a How to Be an Ally Summit. We have um, a membership group that will be coming uh, relatively soon. A number of other you know, resources that we have for people on how to engage in this work. And we do a lot of consulting work in actually supporting people in their learning and development. So we're here to serve. If there's anything that we can do uh, to help you as you're going along this process, if you're looking to move away from just talking about these things or dreaming about these mm -hmm. things and actually being the ones who people can say, look, that's the organization I want to work for. That's the one I want to model after. Um, if that's what you want to do, we are here to support you in getting there. Yeah, fantastic. And I would really encourage people um, to check it out, to check out Deanna's work and the organizations and the book, because as we said here during the interview, you need help. I mean, we, we don't know how to do everything. And these are challenges that maybe they've always existed, but they're ones that we have the uh, ability now to solve if we do it systematically. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dan, for your time. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.